Good morning, everybody. It is indeed great to see you here on a beautiful Sabbath morning. I am so happy that you have chosen to worship with you or with us. I don't know where I got the you there, but anyway, I did. But it's great to have you here on a beautiful Sabbath day. Some of our our members are this week are camping up on the Mount Bighorn Mountains, and we wish them the, that they will have a wonderful time and that they will have a safe time while they're up there and that they will be blessed up there. Others spent last Sabbath up at the mountain um, having worship service up there. A couple weeks ago, there was a group that uh, went camping from another one of our churches, but it's Labor Day weekend, a weekend that we we celebrate those that have, uh, those that work for a living and I guess we all work for a living whether we want to admit it or not, or hopefully we do anyway. I'd like to start out this morning, but um, this sermon is going to be a little bit short. Um, I tried to rewrite it so it might be a little bit longer, and what I added I didn't like, so I took back out. Um, But I came across a website, and you're going to get a kick out of this. I came across a website called The Mother of all excuses. Oh yeah, I kid you not. It was set up so people could share excuses that they've used so so that others can take advantage of the of their excuses. There were over 400 excuses to use on the job. More than 500 excuses for cutting class are listed for those that are just about ready to go back to school or have just gone back to school. There are several hundred excuses for breaking dates. There are excuses for cheating on a diet. And of course, there are excuses for when you get pulled over. And here's a just a couple of the uh, favorite excuses that I found. I will be late to work because my pharmacy is mixing a special ointment. Uh, makes you kind of wonder what's going on, doesn't it? I can't make it because my wife is scheduled to conceive a child today. Okay, yeah, I kid you not. That's literally one of the excuses that's there. I can't make it to work because, and I almost hate to say this one, this one could get me in trouble, but I can't make it to work today because the voices in my head told me to clean my guns today. Yeah, I kid you not. That's really in there. I must cancel my speaking engagement tonight because I punctured my eardrum being too aggressive with my Q-tip. The first wannabe follower we looked at was last week in last week's sermon who comes to Jesus and says, I want to follow you. But Jesus says to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. But this man has come to Jesus, come to him. We don't know much about him other than he gave an excuse for not following Jesus. Then he said to another, and this is Jesus speaking, and I'll put it up on the board. It comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 59 and 60. Luke chapter 9, verses 59 and 60. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, but the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus invites this man to follow him. We are not told his name. Had he agreed to follow Jesus, well, then maybe possibly there would have been 13 disciples and not just 12. But he didn't say yes, and the scriptures doesn't tell us who he was, and history has long forgotten him. Jesus spoke exactly two words, the same two words that he said to Matthew and to the other disciples. He offered this man the same two-word invitation, and he's offering that same two-word invitation to you and me. That two-word invitation is Follow me. The 
This man seemed willing. It appears he wanted to accept the invitation to follow. But the first words out of his mouth is, Lord. He refers to him in the, in the same title as an enslaved person would say to his master. This is an in indication that he knows what Jesus is asking of him. But the second word out of his mouth is the word first. He wants to follow Jesus, but he isn't, well, now isn't a good time for him. And I've often wondered, is it a good time for you and me to follow Jesus? He wants to follow Jesus, but now isn't a good time for this man. He tries to offer an excuse an excuse to put Jesus off for a little while. My question this morning, do we do the same thing? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear, kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have on a beautiful Sabbath day to be able to worship together, fellowship together gain strength and encouragement from one another, and I ask that you will be with our sermon today. May, may the words that I speak be your words and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus doesn't seem interested in this man's excuse, but I must tell you, his excuse seems reasonable. At least in our Western way of thinking, it seems reasonable. He wants to have a funeral for his father. Isn't Jesus being a little too hardcore? Let the guy bury his dad. It should be pointed out that this guy's dad was literally still living, and other than a bad cold or perhaps, or perhaps a sprained ankle or a bum knee, he was probably in good health. Why do I say this? Because in the Jewish culture, when a person died, they would be embalmed and buried within 24 hours. And there were certainly different mourning rites and stages that had to take place and rituals that had to be done following a person's death. Otherwise, this man would be ceremoniously unclean. When the man says, let me go and bury my father, it's another way of saying, hey, when my parents die, I will follow you. We're not sure why he's waiting for them to die. Would they not approve of their son following this un unconventional and controversial rabbi? Was he afraid of telling them he wouldn't be carrying on the family business? And that might be a legitimate, a, a legitimate um, reason for him to, to want to delay because it was a tradition that your son carries on in your profession. But whatever the reason, there is a sense in which most of us resonate with his excuse. It isn't that he wasn't willing, it's just not good timing. He's saying, he isn't saying no, he's saying, hey, just not right now. I, sp I suspect many fans feel okay about this half-hearted relationship with Jesus because they intend to go all in and be wholly committed someday. They don't feel convicted about not following Jesus because in their minds, they know that one day they will. They let themselves off the hook for a lukewarm faith because they didn't tell Jesus anything. They didn't tell him no, just, hey, Jesus, wait a little bit longer. So how does Jesus respond to this man's excuse to bury his father. Jesus did not say, hey, I understand. You know that when the time is right. He did not say, I don't want you 
to put any pre- I don't want to put any pressure on you. Take your time. He didn't say, whenever you're ready, I'll be right here. Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. It gives you some indication how Jesus feels about our excuses and our, and our procrastination. Car- contrast him with this, contrast this man's re- response to the response of the first disciples that Jesus called. Let's take a look at it in Matthew chapter 18, or chapter 4, excuse me, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20 says, put it up on the screen for you, and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother, his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. When fans are asked, they will get serious about their commitment to follow Jesus. The most common answer is, hey, I'm more than willing to do this, but how about tomorrow? The problem is, tomorrow never comes. It says in verse 20 that these disciples responded at once, and in verse 22, it says immediately, that's the commitment Jesus was looking for from his followers. We tend to treat a relationship with Jesus like the diet we keep meaning to start. I'm going to start eating right as soon as I finish off this chicken chimichanga. Tomorrow for sure, we treat our relationship with Jesus like a workout program we keep meaning to start. We go to bed telling ourselves, tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to wake up early and exercise, but the following night we find ourselves getting to, getting into bed promising, hey, I didn't do it today, so I'm going to do it tomorrow. The invitation of Jesus to follow him, there is an RSVP date, and it reads, not yesterday, not tomorrow, it reads today. The word tomorrow is not in the Holy Spirit's vocabulary. When Jesus calls us to follow him, he means, hey, right now, this very moment, he means today. The question is, the question is, how long have been you been saying tomorrow? Technically, if you said it yesterday, then today is tomorrow, which means the time is now. But even if you, but even as you study your Bible and agree with it, there is probably a part of you like this man in Luke 9 that says, but first, let me. I have a friend by the name of Scott who's about 10 years older than me. He told me about going to church in high school and feeling God calling him to get serious about a relationship with him. Still, Scott said, I will, but first, let me graduate from high school. I'll get serious in college. Scott graduated from high school, and once in college, God again called him to be a committed follower. And you can guess it again. Scott said, absolutely, I will. But first, 
let me graduate from college. After he got his diploma, God said, hey, what about now? And Scott said, I will, but first, hey, let me find a job. I need, I need to be able to support myself. He found a job and became consumed by the work of that job. But he promised God, I'm going to get serious about following you, but first, I'm going to get married and let things slow down. Eventually, I, I don't know why people think things are going to slow down when you get married. There's now not only you, but there's somebody else, and oftentimes shortly thereafter, there's a baby that's born. I don't know how people get this idea that once they're married, life is going to slow down. It just doesn't seem to work that way. Eventually, he and his wife got married. I'm glad that they did, and they had, as like I just mentioned, a few kids. When the kids were young, he and his wife discussed as a lot of couples do, maybe we should return to church and go to church for the kids. But it never seemed like quite the right time. For more than 25 years, Scott told Jesus tomorrow. The good news is Scott recently heard Jesus say, what about now, and he responded. He finally responded and completely committed his life to following Jesus. But yet his story is like the story that I hear way too often of people putting off Jesus with their whole hearts. For years they tell Jesus tomorrow. While I'm glad tomorrow eventually came for Scott, he would say to you that he lost a lot in the land of tomorrow. His wife left him and took the kids. Now he gets to see them every other weekend, leaving him plenty of time to attend the local Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. The land of tomorrow is where you find divorces, addictions, and unmanageable debt. In the land of tomorrow, you will discover unfaithful spouses and prodigal children. For the, fan who, who, for the fans who are always telling Jesus tomorrow, I've discovered that tomorrow only comes or becomes today when tragedy strikes and dreams become shattered. Their life is broken into a thousand pieces, but they finally give their life to Jesus. After years of putting him off, they finally turn to him in desperation ready to surrender, ready to surrender their whole life to Jesus. Jesus isn't just whispering, follow me. He's not just whispering, follow me to some of you. He's been shouting, follow me to get your attention before you lose any more time in the land of tomorrow. Several years ago, a friend of mine bought a car. Yep. He bought a car. It was a Plymouth Breeze. I was going to get a picture of a Plymouth Breeze and put it up on the screen, but I ran out of time. It was a, keep in mind that a Plymouth Breeze is not a car that people save up to buy. It's a car people end up with because it's all they can afford. It seems like something was always wrong with the vehicle. At one point, the check and en engine light came on. He opened the hood and started the engine, sure en and stared at the engine, and sure enough, the engine was there. He's not sure why it said check engine if the engine was already there. But that's about all he knew how to do. And to be truthfully honest, it was, it was a little tricky to get that hood open. So I'm glad that he was able to do it. It surprised me that he even got that far. Every time he started the car, that check engine light would blink at him. He continued to convince him, himself that nothing was wrong with the vehicle. 
and he certainly didn't have the money to fix it, so his cure was to put a piece of black electrical tape over the blinking light, problem solved, or so he thought. Then one day, while driving home from the grocery store, he stepped on the gas, the engine revved up, but the car didn't move. The blinking light was there to tell him that there was a serious problem that was developing, and if not taken care of at some point, it would leave him as a driver stranded. You can't ignore, you can ignore the blinking light and even mask the light, but the light is there to get your attention. You can even pretend that light isn't there and flashing at you, and you can go right on thinking all is okay. But the light is an early warning system. If you pay attention to it, you can save yourself stress, heartbreak, and a small fortune. So when the light comes on, it is a call to action. There are natural consequences when we refuse to follow Jesus and instead go our own way. (coughs) I'm not saying that God causes those things, but I am saying that he often allows these blinking lights to get our attention so we'll get on the right path and follow him. I could tell you story after story about fans who told Jesus tomorrow over and over again, but it was when life suddenly became overwhelming that tomorrow became today. There are plenty of stories I could tell you. A daughter is diagnosed with cancer. Parents get divorced. The addiction seems unbeatable. The future seems overwhelming and a relationship falls apart. It is then Jesus becomes more than a guy knocking on your heart's door. He becomes the only hope, and they finally decide to follow Jesus. The most dangerous part of following Jesus' tomorrows isn't what you will lose between now and then. That's not the worst thing that can happen. The worst thing that can happen is that tomorrow might never come. The truth is that the longer you put him off, the more likely it it is that following him will never happen. Saying tomorrow is like, it's like hitting the snooze button on your alarm in the morning. Let's say you set your alarm for 6 a.m. That's a reasonable time to get up in the morning. The alarm goes off, it wakes you up, you could be sure, alarm goes off, it wakes you up, but you could sure use 10 more minutes of sleep. So you hit the snooze button, the following day it goes off again, and you hit snooze again. By the next week, you're hitting snooze three or four times, and the alarm goes off longer and longer before it wakes you up. Jesus said to you, follow me. But you tell him, hey, I want 10 more minutes. The 10 more minutes ends up being one more day, two more days, several more days, several more months, several more years. The more you put him off, the less likely he is to be able to get your attention. But the more you hit the snooze button, the harder it is for you to hear and respond the next time that alarm goes off. And you may eventually find that you'll sleep right through the snooze. <clears throat> Maybe you have have heard of the as now, so then principle of human behavior. Simply stated, the as now, so then principle suggests that current habits are overwhelmingly the most likely predictor of 
future practices. The vast majority of time, the decision you make today will be the decision that you make tomorrow. If you don't do it now, there's no reason to think you will ever do it later. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 15, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 15 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Or if you want to take it in another translation today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. The time is now. The time is not tomorrow. The time is not the next day, a week after, a month after. The time is now. The day is today. Don't tell yourself tomorrow I'm going to surrender that secret sin. Don't tell yourself tomorrow, yes, tomorrow, I will start being generous to those in need. Don't tell yourself tomorrow, tomorrow, I will walk across the street and introduce myself to the neighbor. Don't tell me, don't tell yourself tomorrow, I'm going to check on going on that mission trip and sign up for a Bible study and volunteer at the homeless shelter or call about being a foster home to children in need. Today is the day to start following Jesus. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Dear kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had on a beautiful Sabbath day. And we ask, well, we've looked at two of these stories in Luke now, and you're asking us to follow you, and we come up with all these different excuses as to the reason why we can't. But you're longing for a relationship with us. You're asking us to follow you. You don't want us to wait any longer. May, may you give us the strength and the courage to step out in faith and says, say, I will follow you today. In Jesus' name, amen.